in, uh, personality driven, but it isn't personality driven. It's, I suppose sometimes it might be, but but basically, you know, the, the the Department of State and the Department of Defense and the Central Intelligence Agency all report to different uh, committees in the Congress. And those oversight committees get their own turf and their own preferences and, and, and they then drive those institutions over time to certain directions and positions and they become turf conscious, uh, the jurisdictions of those committees. And, and so you end up with differences of opinion flowing up from the committees through the institutions to the individuals who are arguing those, those points. And, um, but the press carries it as Joe is against Mike or something. And, and uh, it, it really isn't that way as, as much as, as one would think from reading the newspapers. In Known and Unknown, and by the way, the proceeds from Known and Unknown that would have gone to the Secretary and Mrs. Rumsfeld are all donated to uh, charities and organizations that serve the men and women of the United States military, which is a very... And, and, and they deserve it. Uh, you mentioned in Known and Unknown a couple of times that you had a reputation for being a fierce person to brief. And you, you bristle at that. You said you didn't mind the give and take. You wanted people to give and take back to you. How much of the culture of leaking has destroyed the ability for senior officials and commanders to get that kind of exchange for fear of it being misrepresented? That's an interesting question um, for a Harvard lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to save my I went to Michigan Law. I did Harvard Oh, I'm relieved. Okay. okay. I'm relieved. <laughs> um, I did want to hear what people thought. Now, we, and the people I worked with knew that. Uh, and I would, I can remember writing a memo to a CIA guy who sat in the back of the room and he had served in, in the Middle East and I knew he knew more than the people in the room who were talking. And I remember sending him a, a note and telling him, look, Doug, Doug on it, I want you to speak up. I don't want you to sit in the back of the room knowing more than the people who are talking and not saying anything. And I really feel that way. Now, that's on the one hand. The other hand is, if I ask somebody a question and they come up with a stupid answer, it's hard to hide it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but the people I worked with knew that I wanted them to come back at me. And, and the idea that a bunch of generals and admirals with three and four stars on their shoulder are too intimidated to say what they think is, is an, it would be an embarrassment for the United States military. That's just nonsense. I mean, if pe those people uh, serve our country with distinction. They don't get all the way up there uh, that high up without having the, the guts to stand up and say what they think and, and know that it's important that they, and if they're in the room, they darn well ought to be willing to say what they think. That's an oblique reference to the controversy about not having enough troops at the time of the invasion of Iraq. We talked about it on the radio show today, but that is a centerpiece of known and unknown as well. And what is your, what is your response to that? If we'd only had more troops, the aftermath wouldn't have happened. Well, I suppose the first thing one would say is that the road not traveled is always smoother. Um, the, the idea that I decided the number of troops is mythology. Um, the combatant commander has the responsibility for fashioning a, a, a battle plan and a war plan. And in the case of Afghanistan and Iraq, General Tom Franks did that. And he has a large staff to do it. It involves the major combat operations. It involves preparation, major combat operations, and post-major combat operations stabilization efforts. He then brings that up and works it with the chiefs, all of the heads of the services. He, he brings it up eventually and deals with the National Security Council and the senior people in the Department of Defense. And we ended up with an iterative process where it went back and forth because there was not a contingency plan, for example, for Afghanistan. It just didn't exist. Um, there was nothing on the shelf. There was no guidebook. There was no roadmap. And, um, and, and eventually, everyone agreed. And what he had in the case of Iraq was, I think, 450,000 tro uh, troops in, in 
trained, ready to go in if they were needed. He had off ramps in case they were not needed. And uh, he then recommended that at a certain level, I forget where it was, major combat operations in Iraq were highly successful very rapidly. And, um, and he recommended that more not go in. And I agreed with him. And, and I don't know anyone who disagreed with him. Uh, certainly no one I heard disagreed with him. Uh, it, certainly no one on the Joint Chiefs, no one in the uh, National Security Council disagreed. And um, it, at some point, uh, the insurgency began to, to grow. And Saddam Hussein let 100,000 people out of his prisons. Uh, he called for jihad and people started flowing in from Iran and from Syria and from neighboring countries. The Saddamists, uh, the Ba'athist group that had been running the country for years, it was concerned because it looked like the, the Shia were going to be in charge and not the, the um, Sunnis. And so they started what they called the party of return and began the insurgency and over time the insurgency uh, grew and at that point more troops were desirable and 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 came in I mean uh, the, the commanders on the ground increased now is it conceivable that you if you'd had more troops in the immediate aftermath that there might have been less of an insurgency it's conceivable um, one of the big problems we had was everyone assumed that the Turks would let us come in from the north and they didn't and as I recall it was the fourth uh, infantry division that was scheduled to come in there. We lost it. We got a majority of the votes in the Turkish parliament. We missed it by one or two votes. They had to come in from the south and the north was where the Sunni uh, heavy population was and, and therefore they did not engage the Sunnis, the armed military forces coming in from the south, basically came through Shia area and did not engage the Sunni north and a lot of those folks were able to uh, get away and, and not ever be engaged in a battle and that probably increased the size of the insurgency. Now, you know, hindsight's 2020, and, um, and any plan, I'm sitting here looking, we've got a, a three-star general sitting in the second or third row, so I've got to be careful how I talk. <laughs> but, but any plan goes out the window uh, with first contact with the enemy. I think it was Eisenhower who said, you know, the plan is nothing, planning is everything. Because once you hit the enemy, he's got a brain. And he begins doing things and adjusting, and, and the, that requires our military people to adjust the tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, so that's how I answer that question. Uh, I, I was, it, to the extent a mistake was made, I was clearly complicit because I agreed completely with General Fines. In the in known and unknown, you compliment by name some reporters: John Burns, Dexter Filkins, and others. Only New York because Times. they were better than others. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you also take a lot of time to detail how the museum looting story was completely blown. How a number people, of I hope people Brave will read blown. that. Yeah. So, what is it about the American media, and have you seen it changing over 40 years, that have made them so disposed to be critical of the American uh, uh, military and its uh, effectiveness? I don't think the the uh, media is. Um, more critical of the military than of anything else. I think that they subscribe to the old adage, if it bleeds, it leads. If someone makes a mistake, that's more important than someone doing something right. And I think that's true in the med in, with respect to the military, but practically everything else as well. Um, the, the more important thing, it seems to me, is that no one ever has written anything about it, no one said anything about it, uh, but the fact is that we're human beings and, and we're the ones who receive the media. And what we were doing is we're fighting the first wars of the 21st century, the first wars of the information age. And in World War II, we, we would get war news in a 10 or 12 minute preview before a movie. We didn't have television. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have 24-hour news. We didn't have any of those things. And, and then you go into Korea and, and Vietnam. Vietnam, for the first time, we had some television. 
but none of these other things. And I don't think that our society, you and me and all of us, have our inner gyroscopes. Everyone knows what a gyroscope is. It's, it's probably a new electronic thing that's totally different that I don't know about. But, but uh, it, it, you know, that our balance wheels, they are, haven't adjusted to the 21st century information age. And, and all of a sudden, instead of getting 12 minutes or, or 15 minutes before a movie uh, on a war news, it was just flooding in on everyone's emails and everyone's television and everyone's Twitters and Facebooks and all this other stuff. And, and it's disorienting. And a not overwhelming part of it's wrong. I mean, a lie races around the room three, four, five, t around the world three, four, five times before the truth gets its boots on. And, and what does that mean? That means that you spend all your time trying to clean up after what was wrong. And I believe you have graded the Bush administration's messaging and communications effort as a D minus. I believe that's what you said. What would you? Have I'm done, a hard grader. What would you have done differently? <laughs> how would you have changed how you led the war and how the president advised the president to lead differently when it came to communication, knowing now what you didn't know then? The um, the problem we had is that. The, the, uh, Carl Rowe is a very smart guy. And Carl wrote in his book that, that that was one of the major mistakes, was not communicating uh, exactly what was going on and, and on the weapons of mass destruction, for example. But the other problem was that when everyone in the administration was very sensitive about not wanting to be seen as anti-Muslim. And so when you, you're not against a country, in this case. I mean, when you're against Germany or Japan, you get it. They invaded other countries and it's clear. When, when you're dealing with a, a small element, a, a radical Islamist as part of the Muslim religion, and you do not want to be seen as anti-Muslim because you're not, and yet you know people are going to try to paint it that way, which they do. I mean, it, it, you look at the papers today, you can see that that's what's going on. Um, so that you get cautious and you hold back. Now, we didn't have that problem. We, you know, World War I started and ended, World War II started and ended. Cold War didn't. Cold War went on for decades and it took staying power. You had to be persistent. It had to go through administrations of both political parties and it had to be a coalition of countries. What we're going through today is much more like that. And it was a competition of ideas between freedom and communism. And we competed against communism. And it was a lousy system. And it failed and they lost. Except in Cuba and Venezuela, I suppose. <laughs> and North Korea. And look, look at them. I mean, what, what an example of failure. We're in a competition of ideas against people who are determined to kill innocent men, women, and children to try to impose their views of how this world ought to be ordered. They are fundamentally against nation states. They are fundamentally against other religions. Not the Muslim religion is not. The small group of radical Islamists are. Now, people are afraid. I mean, if you want to see the extreme of being afraid to talk about this, look at this administration. I mean, they, they won't even use the word. And how in the world can you win if you don't identify the enemy? In, in your famous long hard slog memo, when you ask about metrics and how many terrorists are the madrasas putting up, that was never answered. You just said a small percentage of Islam is radicalized. What percentage do you think that is? Have you quantified yet what the nature of the threat is in your own mind, Donald Rumsfeld? No. And, and I, I suppose confession of, of ignorance is, is a beginning at least. And, and I, I did write a memo saying that. And uh, I even titled my book uh, in a way that tried to tell the world that there are things we know we know and there are things we know we don't know but there are also things we don't know we don't know and I don't know. <laughs> But, but 
in that memo, what I said basically was that we don't have metrics, we don't know whether we're gaining or losing. We know we're out killing and capturing terrorists and radical Islamists. And we know how many there are, but we don't know how many are being trained or how many are being recruited or how many are being funded while we're doing that. And, and, and unless you compete in the battle of ideas and persuade people that, that's, that they ought to be teaching people how to get a job or how to function in society, instead of teaching people how to strap bombs on their bodies and, and stick them on kids' bodies and stick them into marketplaces and blow them up, we don't know how, how much that's going on. But, but the Bush administration, to the great credit of the president, uh, fashioned a coalition of some well, over 90 countries. I mean, you had Senator Kerry and others running around saying, you oh, George Bush was a unilateralist. Nonsense. The coalition was over 90 countries sharing intelligence, tracking bank accounts, trying to see who's funding these terrorists, and, and putting coalitions together to, to deal with uh, Afghanistan, coalitions to deal with, with Iraq, coalitions of different types to deal with um, deal, uh, the, what was it called? I can't remember the name of it, but it was, it was to deal with the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And, and uh, big coalitions of countries. And, and yet you know the effort and I would submit you know the result. There has not been a successful attack on the United States of America in close to a decade. And, and, and that didn't just happen. That, 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 that is because of Guantanamo. It's because of it, in, indefinite detention. It's because of military commissions. It's because of the coalition and putting pressure on terrorists all across the globe to make everything they do harder. Harder to recruit, harder to talk on the phone, harder to move around, harder to find a country that'll accept them. Now, have we, have we solved the problem? No. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be more like the Cold War. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take persistence and perseverance. Now, Mr. Secretary, when the war began, when the attack began, the entire country united. And from that time forward, you've seen the base of people who are actively involved in the support of the mission and the support of the troops getting narrower and narrower and narrower as the communication of the urgency has fallen. So that, the entire burden is on the uniformed services and very little of the civilian. Did your administration do enough to teach people this is going to be a generational struggle and they have to be in it for that kind of a length of time? Well, how many times has anyone heard what I just said? Very few. It, casting it the way I did as something that's long term. It's true, we're all human beings. You know, fear focuses the mind. And with time, the fear goes away. There hasn't been another successful attack. We kind of relax and we say, gee, maybe we don't have to be quite as worried as we were. Um, no, I, 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 I mean, I tried, I kept asking myself, you know, I grew up during World War II. I was born in 1932. My dad went in the Navy, everyone, had Victory Gardens and we bought $18.75 war bonds that if you kept them long enough it was worth $25. And we saved our hangers and we saved the grease out of the frying pan for ammunition and, and grew, grew uh, vegetables and the like. Every houses had a little thing in the window with a, a, a star on it and if the person's killed it became a gold star on the little flag, and people felt engaged. Uh, I kept asking myself, what's the 21st century parallel to Victory Gardens? I, you know, I don't know what it is. I do know the people who really get it are the people who are fighting. The men and women in uniform, and, and you go visit them in the hospitals, and you talk to them out in the field, and they understand, and they're proud of what they're doing. They understand that they're making progress. They can feel it. And when they're wounded, they, their basic interest is, is how, do, how do I get back to my unit? How do I get back engaged? And their, their families are proud of them and proud of their service. 
uh, it, it is so impressive to see it. And the rest of us who are not that directly engaged don't have something like a victory garden. Uh, and, and it's only intellectual. And it's hard to sustain that. I mean, it, it, I remember when, when I was President Reagan's, and I talk about this in the book, President Reagan's Middle East Envoy, after 241 Marines and, and uh, Navy corpsmen were killed in, at the Beirut airport. The feeling in the country was, was deep and, and really concerned about terrorism and about that risk to our country. And, um, you know, a week goes by and a month goes by and, and that feeling of concern eases and um, the, the desire to do something about it diminishes. Well, we went through a lot of those. The USS Cole, the attacks on our embassies, and, and not much was done about it. And, and Osama bin Laden and the terrorists took a message from that. That, that not much was done about any of that whole series of things that led up to 9-11. And I'm answering way too long, but, but let me say one other thing. Right after 9-11, I went to Oman, and I met with the Sultan of Oman, Qaboos. It's a little bitty country next to Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And he brought that little piece of real estate into the 20th century. Uh, the Sultan did. Smart man, and and I met, I'd met with him when I was Middle East envoy. But so I went back to talk to him, and he was in a tent. It must have been 120 degrees. He was out meeting with his people, and uh, the three or four of us that were there, we were. Good Lord Almighty! <laughs> I beg your pardon. I, I I won't slap my mic again. <laughs> unless I forget. <laughs> but we, we were dripping right through, you know, our undershirts, our shirts, our coats. And he said this amazing thing. He said, 9-11 may be a blessing in disguise. He said, it may be just what is necessary to wake up America and the world to the dangers of, of the extremists, the radicals, and, and to do it before there is a weapon of mass destruction. And it's not 3,000 people dead as it was on 9-11, but it's 300,000 or 3 million. I mean, I say that and it sounds breathtaking. How can that be? There was a dark winter study done by Johns Hopkins where a bunch of very intelligent people sat down and, and put in an exercise where they postulated smallpox being put in three cities in America. And within a matter of months, one million were dead and three million were infected. Now think of that. Not a nuclear weapon, a, a biological weapon. And that study, coupled with the repeated um, instances of, of intelligence coming in where the system was blinking red led President Bush and his administration to be deeply concerned about weapons of mass destruction. And Caboose said maybe, maybe what happened on 9-11 will be what will prevent that 300,000 or 3 million people killed. But we are living in a time when the lethality of these weapons is totally different from when I was a young man totally different and 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 that is and the proliferation of those weapons is easier it's still complicated with nuclear weapons don't get me wrong but with chemical and biological weapons it is not that complicated and if there's anything we need to be worried about it's 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 the combination of the increasing lethality of those weapons and the proliferation of those weapons coupled with the complexities of intelligence gathering. It is a very tough job that our intelligence community has. Let me ask you about, you mentioned the Middle East envoy role that you played for President Reagan. One of the most poignant points of uh, known and unknown is when you were in Lebanon, 
uh, after you almost get blown up. I think you're talking to Mrs. Rumsfeld at one point, and you get blown up. But uh, you go she back. She did was not you, blowing me up. No, she didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it was from the Baca Valley. Yes. But uh, you're in the the president of Lebanon's office when we cut the cord, when we pull the plug, oh. and it's a very poignant scene. Are we about to do the same thing in Afghanistan? What we did in South Vietnam? What we did in Lebanon to people who have relied on us? And to what effect long term in the United States and the world? I don't think so. I, I, I think it's different. Um, it was a heartbreaking for me to have to go into President Amin Jamal and, and tell him that the United States government had decided they were going to pull their troops out of Lebanon and leave him pretty much to the Syrians' um, pleasure. And, and um, it, it was a tough evening. I went into his building where he, his presidential house and there was blood outside where they, some of the guards who'd been hit by shells and the windows, some windows were broken and I remember white drapes blowing in the breeze and, and to go in and have to tell them that the President uh, Reagan and the National Security Council had decided they were going to withdraw our, our troops was a, a tough thing to do. I would think that this is quite different. Uh, I mean, take Afghanistan. You've got a, a, a landlocked country with tough neighbors that had 10 or 12 years of Soviet occupation, drought, civil war, years and years of civil war. And what do they have now? Well, over a million uh, refugees who'd left the country have come back. They fashion a constitution. Their economy is, is growing. They've elected a parliament. They've elected a president, and if our people in the administration would stop savaging Karzai and, and criticizing him constantly and, and recognize that he is the elected leader of that country and, and he, he's got to make it work, I think they have a chance. What, what, what the American people have done and what the United States Armed Forces have done is given the Afghan people a chance. Now, we can't go in and build another country. People talk about nation building. I'm just not a believer. I just don't think we're smart enough. We don't know the culture. We don't know the history of these countries. We don't speak the language. What can we do? Well, we can go after the Al-Qaeda. We can go after the Taliban, move them out of office, see that they elect, fashion their own constitution, elect their own people, and then wish them well. Help train and equip their military and wish them well. You can't, you can't live their lives for them. It's kind of, I hate to use this analogy, but I did it again. You did it again. I hate to use this analogy, but we've all had kids, and you, and you want to teach them to ride a bike. And so you stick them on the bike, and you grab the back of the seat, and you run down the road with them. And they start pedaling, and they start wobbling around, and, and you have your whole hand on it. And then at some point, you just have four fingers. At some point, you have three fingers. Pretty soon you have one finger, and then you let go. And y y what could happen? They could fall, or they could learn to ride a bike. And if you don't take that last finger off, you could end up with a 40-year-old who can't ride a bike. <laughs> and I. Uh... President uh, Lincoln and Secretary of War Stanton have great historical reputations, uh, but they didn't do so well picking generals for a long time until they got to Grant. How do you think uh, you and President Bush will be judged when it comes to the selection of senior commanders in a war? Oh, probably like everybody, imperfectly. You know, but uh, you constantly ask yourself if you've got the right person. You're constantly encouraging that person and you're constantly checking with the person and with people around them and people under them. I guess it was Admiral Rickover said, you never give an order outside of the chain of command and you, you never expect to learn much up the chain of command. So you're constantly checking around, talking to other people and trying to take temperatures and see how they're going. And um, um, I mean, you take John Abizade. Uh, he, um, he replaced Franks when Franks left, uh, decided he wanted to retire. And 
And Abzaid, you know, he spoke Arabic. He was uh, had an advanced degree, smart guy. And I remember he he came to me at one point and said, "Mr. Secretary, I think you need fresh eyes on this." In other words, he he felt that fresh eyes were needed. And um, it is hard. It is a tough. Those are tough jobs. And um, y you know, I. I um, I, I, I watched them, I visited with them frequently, as did President Bush and the National Security Council. Uh, they met with the chiefs regularly and got their advice and counsel. Um, what's going on today is not terribly dissimilar from what went on then. Um, there are things that have changed, to be sure. A lot of things have changed. Uh, you take Iraq. Um, You've had the, the Sunnis decide that they're going to participate, and, and you had the so-called awakening. And that started back in early 06, and that made a big difference when, when they stopped. They didn't, they, they tired of the Al-Qaeda. The Al-Qaeda were raping their kids and, and, and uh, uh, taking their businesses and, and abusing them, and the, the Sunnis decided they didn't like that anymore. And instead of not voting, they decided to vote and participate, and that was a big deal. Sadr decided to go to Iran for a while and calm down, and the so-called Sadr army, which is really a bunch of thugs, uh, stopped going out in the streets. Uh, there, were, there were any number, the, the Iraqi uh, armed forces grew from zero up to uh, 365,000, I think, by, uh, uh, by that period in 06. So lots was changing on the ground. And uh, it, 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 was, it, it wasn't a new general, it was, it was a series of people who were doing that. I mean, Petraeus was training and equipping the uh, Iraqi security forces, for example. But we've had some excellent military people. They served there at different times. The, what, the facts on the ground were different. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we made bad, I, that I made bad judgments. I'm sure of that. I'm also sure that uh, there weren't people saying that or recommending different things. And I don't know if it's the facts on the ground that changed. Or, but the idea that if you had surged, we surged the same number of increase in troops in I think 04 and 05 as was done in late 06 didn't make any difference. What was different were, were the Sunnis. What was different was, was Sadr's group. What was different uh, were the circumstances that evolved. Now there, there's an easy distinction for a civilian to make, and you see reporters make it all the time, between political generals and war fighting generals. And you know, they say Eisenhower, Patton, or McClellan, and, and Grant. Is that a legitimate distinction in your view, Mr. Secretary? Well, you know, one of my problems with, with uh, the, the, the phrase war on terror is that it left the impression that we could win what we're doing, this struggle against violent extremists that the, what you say war, it means the Pentagon can win it. It means that bullets can win it. And there is no way bullets are gonna win this. This is something that's gonna take all elements of national power. It's gonna take competing in, in the competition of ideas. It's gonna take developing strength within those countries so that they have institutional capability. One other thing that took place is the Iraqi government developed and matured. And, and, and got better. It decided, in fact, the Maliki government, as weak as it was, went down and took after some of the, uh, uh, the terrorists down in, in the Basra area and, and demonstrated a willingness to go after those people. So there were lots of things that changed. But, but I, I don't think that that is necessarily a, an appropriate if, if I were going to think of ways to categorize people, when you're dealing with the kind of conflict we're in, I don't think that that would be the first thing that would leap to mind, uh, a Patton versus an Eisenhower. I, I think that what you really got is you've got, you've got to have the Pentagon doing what it can do, but we're dealing with an asymmetrical set of problems. It's not conventional. It's not like big armies, navies, and air forces. 
which is what the Pentagon's basically prepared to do, it, it, as I say, it takes all elements of national power and it takes competing in, in, in ideas and it takes bringing into play people from other departments and agencies and other countries to, to strengthen ministries and, and provide some support uh, for the institutional capability of those countries. I have two more questions before we go to the audience questions. Um, and this one, uh, there's an author by the name of Stephen Pressfield. He wrote Gates of Fire. And have you familiar with him at all? There's a new book coming out called The Brotherhood, which picks up on what Eisenhower warned about, the military-industrial complex, mm -hmm. getting bigger and international. It's a fascinating book. Do you worry about a military-industrial complex in the way that Ike does or Pressfield does or others? You know, if you're in a world war, uh, as Eisenhower was, I can understand his comment. And I've not gone back to read it where he cautioned against the military-industrial complex. I've, I've not gone back to refresh myself on the context. But when I go to bed at night, that is not what I worry about. Um, the, the, when, in the Eisenhower-Kennedy period, when I went to Washington, uh, we were spending 10% of our gross domestic product on defense. Today we're down below 4 or 5%. We were spending, you know, 40, 50% of the federal budget. Now we're down in the 20s, as I recall. Um, it, 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 the problem we've got is, is not the thing that, that that phrase conjures up in our minds, a military-industrial complex. Um, We've got the Iron Triangle. We've got the Congress, which is semi-permanent. We've got the, the defense industries. And we've got the bureaucracy in the Department of Defense. And they get very comfortable with what is. And you try to change it, and oh my goodness. You know, I, mean, I canceled the Crusader weapon system, which was an artillery system that it took two major aircraft, cargo aircraft, to, to, uh, to move. And I can't think of a worse name than the Crusader in the environment we're in. It's not, it's not an, exactly a brilliant choice. But, but when I, I went against the Army and when I was Secretary the first time on the uh, tank, the Army wanted a 105 howitzer and I thought we might as well standardize with Europe on a 120 millimeter or howitzer. Uh, cannon and and um, the army had always had a diesel tank and we switched to a turbine tank and oh my goodness the the cries of horror and and just everyone went nuts because I decided to to go that way I did the same thing with the Crusader and, and decided to cancel it and put the money uh, the billions of dollars that had not been yet been spent into precision. Uh, firepower, which we did, which I am convinced in retrospect was exactly the right thing to do. Uh, but oh, when we did it, the hearings up on the hill and penny penny, the sky is falling, everything's going to be, you can't do that. And, and the anger, oh my goodness, the anger. Uh, now, if, if it's that hard, people don't want to do it. If you know you're going to pick up that much scar tissue, by making a decision that the Iron Triangle's uncomfortable with, people aren't going to do it. They just don't want to do it. You, you can only do it so many times and pretty soon you're sunk. Um, so that, that is a bigger problem, the permanent bureaucracies that exist, I would say, than the so-called um, um, military-industrial complex. I think that, 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 that w w it is a when you go to sleep at night, don't worry about the military-industrial complex. Well, then let's, I'll close my questions by asking who to worry about. Now, in your book, you have a very interesting portrait of Putin. You talk a lot about the People's Republic of China. You talk about North Korea. You've already talked about weapons of mass destruction tonight. It's a dangerous world. Now, how do you prioritize those when you look back at uh, your time, Mr. Secretary? In other words, what we should worry about when we yeah. go to bed at night. You know, you, you, the things that leap to mind are the, the, what I mentioned, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, the increasing lethality of these weapons, and their availability. Um, I worry about cyber warfare. 
uh, we are so dependent. The, the most technologically advanced countries are the most dependent on digits. And we've all thrown away the shoe boxes with the three by five cards. So we're, we're dependent and, and vulnerable, very vulnerable to cyber attacks. And there are certainly countries that are developing a great deal of skill in doing that. And we don't have rules of the road. We don't even have a good definition of what is an act of war in cyber warfare. We, we understand it in terms of land, we understand it in terms of air, we understand it in terms of sea. We've even got some rules of the road for space. But for cyberspace, we don't. We don't, we don't have good ideas. But the thing I really worry about is, is, is something that's broader, and that is intelligence gathering. Um, it is a big world, it's a complicated world. People are increasingly sophisticated. Closed societies have a high degree of success in preventing us from knowing what they're doing and how well they're doing it. We have a terribly difficult time measuring intent. Uh, our intelligence um, people are good, they work hard, uh, but it is a very tough job. And, and again, that's why I named the book what I named it. Um, I was given an award for uh, gobbledygook when I, when I, in a press conference, talked about unknown unknowns. And um, obviously, the person who gave me that award didn't get it. <laughs> and I should have given them an award. Well, now I've got, a, uh, got the audience versions of snowflakes here. Uh, who is your favorite historical figure and why? I suppose uh, being from Illinois and, and brought up with Abraham Lincoln, um, I mean, there wouldn't be a United States of America if he hadn't done what he did and gone through what we went through. And it was just, I don't even like to read about the Civil War. I just, I, I, I love history and I love biography, but it makes me so sad that our country went through that and killed so many of our own people on each side. But there, there, this amazing country of ours would not exist, in my view, absent Abraham Lincoln and what he did and what he decided and the choices he made. Um, and here I thought it was going to be Rockefeller. <laughs> Would you tell people about Rocky? There's so much Rocky in the book. I, that was the most surprising thing about Known and Unknown. <laughs> it's in the book. Uh, I was not a fan. <laughs> to, to give him his due, I've talked to people who, who uh, a biographer who was writing a book about him and people who knew him when he was younger. And I think he probably was not at the top of his game when he was serving as um, Gerald Ford's vice president. And, and to be fair, uh, I would say that. But, <laughs> but there's a picture in the book of the two of us looking at each other. And, and the caption that I wrote said, the feeling was mutual. <laughs> All right, next question. Oh boy. Do you feel we should become more involved in Libya? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I, I, I see people on television saying, oh, there should be a no-fly zone, or there should be a no-tank zone, or there should be a no-truck zone, or uh, what have you. It sounds easy. Uh, I'm, I'm, um, I, I think that we, we ought to be very careful, and I, I agree with what my successor, uh, Secretary of Defense Gates, has been saying. Um, that we should be cautious about what we do. There are non-intuitive effects of, of when the United States gets involved. Um, it, 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 um, 
it can have an effect that is not intended. Second, there are two kinds of diplomacy, public and private. And we don't know what we're doing with private diplomacy. Public diplomacy tends to be playing to different audiences, our people, public, press, uh, other countries. There's also things you can do that are overt, and there are also things you can do that are covert. And I hope we're doing some things that are covert. Have you heard anyone in the media discuss, and we talked about it today, so we'll accept that, the after effect of the Iraq invasion on Libya and what we would be dealing with today had it not happened? I mean, have you heard that discussed by oh, sure. mainstream media? Yeah. The people don't talk about the most important thing that, that, that happened, and that was uh, that when Gaddafi was developing a nuclear weapon, and he was well along, and when he saw Saddam Hussein get pulled out of that spider hole by, <laughs> by General Odierno's crew, and then get given over to the Iraqis, tried by the Iraqis, and executed by the Iraqis, he made a command decision that he did not want to be Saddam Hussein II, and he invited the inspectors in and completely dismantled his nuclear program. That is a very big deal. If he had a nuclear weapon today, um, or if there were a nuclear arms race today between Iraq and Iran and, and Libya and other countries, uh, that would not be a good thing for the world. The world's a lot better off uh, without that. I, um, I think that, that the President Bush believed very deeply that freedom was the natural state of man. And that, that uh, anyone who looks at that, my favorite photograph of the Korean Peninsula, uh, a satellite shot at night, where, where the demilitarized zones in the middle, and, and it's all electricity and light in the south, same people north and south, same resources, and in the north it's pitch black, except for one pinpoint of, of light in Pyongyang, the capital. What does that tell you? It tells you that communist system, command economies don't work, and that free systems really provide those opportunities. I, I just think that, that President Bush was right, that, that freedom is what creates those opportunities. And, and uh, we see that in this wonderful country where people get in line to come here, at, d trying to get a visa to come to the United States. Uh, and and you, you look at what's going on in the world, and some people are speculating that the fact that Iraq, for example, has a constitution, had free elections, elected people they wanted, suggests that even in that part of the world, which has, except for Israel, has, has no history of free systems and free economies and free political systems. Now, is, 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 do we know that Iraq's going to make it? No. Do we, do we think it has a good chance? Yes, it does. It's, it's, it's finding its way. And um, maybe that is suggesting to other people in North Africa that, that maybe it can be done in that part of the world. There are darn few countries like our country. I mean, you look around the world and, and you've got Western Europe and you've got some countries in, in Asia, in Australia and Japan and South Korea, um, but an awful lot of the countries of the world don't have our free political system and our free economic system. And, and to have something going on in that part of the world that suggests it might be possible, maybe there is. A, I can't tie a line from a thread saying that because of this, that's what's happening. And I also would say there's a big danger in North Africa. I mean, they, these, these, these extremists, they may be a small minority, but by golly, they're disciplined, they're vicious, they're well organized. And a lot of the people that are, you're seeing revolting and these revolutions are not well organized and not well disciplined and not vicious. And, and they can get shoved aside like they were shoved aside by Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. If the sort of violence that we see now in Lebanon with the neo-civil war were to begin in Pakistan, which does have 100 plus nuclear weapons, what would the United States have to do in a situation like that? We couldn't stand back, could we, and just watch it? Well, we've done it before, and, and, um, and it's a hard thing to do. Uh, Pakistan has 
I mean, there's another example where the United States kind of told uh, President Musharraf that he ought to take off his uniform and, and be like us. Here's a Muslim country with a lot of extremists, some people who supported the Taliban and the ISI, their intelligence organization and their, their military. And uh, I was perfectly happy with Musharraf having a uniform on. I don't think everyone has to be exactly like us. A country with, with uh, that many nuclear weapons and that many extremists who stood up and supported us and helped us in, in Afghanistan allowed us to use bases, allowed us to, to begin to have military-to-military -military relations, which had been, oh, for a whole generation, had been discontinued. Uh, I like the fact that there was a, a, a strong person who was helpful to us and had a good grip on the military in that country and a reasonable grip on their intelligence organization. Uh, and it bothers me that the, he, he was thrown out after he took off his uniform and uh, what was left? Well, you've got a government that is n not as strong. Um, when, is not as strong and, and um, my, my hope would be, and this sounds anti-democratic, but my, with, with that many nuclear weapons in that country, my hope would be that the military would step up as they did in Egypt and provide some stability and continuity rather than allowing extremists to get a hold of that country with all those nuclear weapons. One last question, because I know we want to give you a chance to sign books and then get you on your way, Mr. Secretary, and from the audience. Great Rumsfeld question. What about Iran do we not know that we do not know? <laughs> a lot. You know that country, uh, we would, they had a revolution and who took over? A handful of ayatollahs. They've got a diverse country. They've got a lot of Kurds in the south. They've got Azeris in the north. They've got a proud history of Persians and, and they are de bound and determined to have nuclear weapons and they're well on the way. Um, but th there's a lot we don't know. Our, our intelligence, the inter when we share intelligence with other countries and you go back and track what was said as to when they're going to have a nuclear weapon or when they're going to do this, that, or the other thing, and you find that we were often wrong. And I, we, we do not, well, let me just be abbreviate, abbreviated. There's a lot we don't know in terms of locations, numbers, depths, and, and um, timing. And we also know that, that that country is being led by people who are violently anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, anti-West. Uh, we are the great Satan. Uh, American people and our country. And um, they, they wish us ill. And that they are constantly in, in putting people, training people to go in and, and do damage in Afghanistan and to do damage in Iraq, supplying weapons, uh, supplying jihadists. It's, it's strange. They also have some problems. They, they have a population that probably doesn't like to live like that. So I, you don't want to make the threat sound too great. And uh, uh, you, you could conceivably have a situation where there could be the kind of popular uprising there. Now, the Revolutionary Guard very likely would put it down pretty hard. Uh, and you don't know where that tipping point is, where, where they, when some of the Revolutionary Guard mates would say, well, I'd rather go with the people. And, and, and you see that happen from time to time. But, but um, I, I look at that situation and I think that, I thought for a while that on the nuclear issue, you could separate the government from a lot of the people. It turned out that the data suggested that the people in that country were not concerned about the fact that their government was proceeding with a nuclear weapon. It's a proud country. Other countries have nuclear weapons. 
and an awful lot of the people in that country, it turns out, that wasn't an issue that energized the populace against their government, which, to be honest, surprised me. And um, so something, at some point in, in probably even my lifetime, there's going to be something that's going to trigger it. I mean, the, the, the Azeri people up in the north, they go into Azerbaijan and go out and have a drink and, and put their bathing suits on and go swimming and, and get away from the Ayatollahs. I mean, it, people go back and forth. That country, I don't think that country permanently wants to be separated from the rest of the world because of their behavior and because of the utterances of a handful of Ayatollahs. I think that the vast majority of the people in that country would like to be better connected to the rest of the world. But it turns out, I don't think that the nuclear issue is going to be the thing that's going to separate them from their um, leadership. Well, on that optimistic but cautious note, uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Please join me in thanking Secretary Rumsfeld. For thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy's got a cup and he's going to go around looking for donations yeah. to the foundation. <laughs> oh, I, I can tell. He's going to tin cup it. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary Rumsfeld, for sharing your extraordinary history with us. And thank you for your 50 years of incredible public service to the United States of America. As a token of our appreciation, I have made, please sit down for just a second, I have, so you can all see this beautiful, elegant, hand-painted mug that I've had made as a token of, of our appreciation with the question, what would Nixon do? Now, I know what you're thinking. So yes, I had a few extras made, and they're now in our gift shop, and you can get them tonight if you go out there and sign up for our family membership, and you can also buy one of these. Secretary Rumsfeld will be in the lobby in a few minutes. Some of you don't have a book signed. You'll be glad to do it. Thank you for coming. Please come back.